Hello and uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to Post Migration in the Arts, Dalits in Focus. This is the fifth in a series of rolling conversations on forced migration and the arts, where we bring together people with lived experience of forced migration, activists, artists, and academics for dialogue on what they are doing and how this speaks to questions around forced migration in the arts. For tonight's event, we are joined by Satkiti Sina, who is an international researcher and folk theater practitioner based at the Performing Arts Department at De Montfort University in Leicester, where as part of his PhD studies, he is developing a performance analysis model for examining folk performance folk performances in post-colonial India. Also joining us is uh, J.D. Sarangi, who is a poet, academic translator, and author of a number of publications on Australian literature, Indian writing in English, post-colonial studies, and uh, the Dalit literary movement in, in India. So, as a way of starting the conversation, uh, we will we'll start with, uh, with, with our two speakers. If you could introduce yourselves and maybe say something about who you are, what you do, where you do it, how it and how it all started. Yeah, so should I go ahead? Yes, please. Yeah, hi everyone. I am Rose, hi Jadeep. So, as uh, Ambrose mentioned about me, I am at present, uh, I am an assistant professor as well as um, I am, it's my third year of PhD and uh, I am a performance, uh, I, I would say like I was more into a practitioner side, uh, but now it's more about the performance anthropology, which I am looking into it. And uh, my core area is understanding and developing a performance analysis model that could help to understand mostly the subaltern performances, which we could call it as the performance. And uh, in that also, I am trying to develop a performance analysis model that could analyze a uh, different hybridity within a Dalit performance that has been developed. And for that, I am focusing on a performance that started in 1917 in eastern part of India, that is Bihar. It was started by a Dalit called Bikhari Thakur. And his idea of performance was to counter all those uh, social evils that was uh, subjugating most of the Dalit community members. And one of the core ideas of his performance was to represent the forceful migration and Again, uh, I would go in detail about when I call something forceful. So forceful migration of Dalits from the eastern part of India to the uh, Caribbean islands and most uh, like in Suriname, Trinidad. And uh, uh, that was basically the terminology which was used to be for this forceful migration and the people who used to migrate. And uh, most of them were Dalits. So uh, the terminology which it was used was known as Bidesia. So Bhikari Thakur has used that terminology and has created his own performance style. So at present, this performance style has been developed into different parts. So for instance, like there is one rural Bidesia, there is one urban Bidesia, there is one Bidesia which is funded by government at present in India. There is one Bidesia which is being performed by diaspora. So it's hard to like pinpoint which is the purest form of Bidesia when it's come to. And that's what is my core idea of developing a performance analysis model. So there are many, not only Bidesia, there are many folk styles which has been performed by Dalits, which has been now developed into different hybridity. And to understand that we need a performance analysis model. And that's what I'm doing right now. So this is my core idea idea and performance uh, related model, which I am developing. Thank you. Wonderful, Thank you. wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I am, uh, I teach in a college and I'm, I'm principal over there. And uh, must, my involvement into Dalit came 
after my experience in Australia, Aboriginal Australians in Australia. And when uh, in one of my visits to Australia after completion of my PhD, and immediately I could uh, understand the Dalit issue in India and relate it to the marginal issues as a post-colonial, I will say, social scientist. Um, I organize and uh, talk and translate Dalit texts into English, mostly from my mother tongue that is called Bengali into English. And very pertinently, as, as Satsuriti has pointed out, how the migration has taken place, forced migration has taken place. In my part of the country, there is a kind of, you know, uh, I would say, great divide of Bengal, West Bengal and the uh, Bangladesh. So many came into West Bengal and other parts of uh, India and after the partition, uh, and they came from a different uh, social strata. And how, on the basis of that, how Indian rehabilitation system works on that. So my main concern about the Dalits is that how activism can be spread and how the active, active, activism and Dalit literary movement can carry it on and to further pass it on to the next generation. And how can it be used as a tool to interpret texts? Because general conception of life is that, you know, the production of the Brahminical knowledge, knowledge of the center. And, but the knowledge about these Dalits and the Sabalcha and who were at the outset of our discussion for many, many, many years. And I, I call them as a product of cultural rigging, cultural rigging. So my concern is that through translation, made making it available for the larger audience. And this is for me at present. I have been involved in two, uh, two, three important books and translations. One of them is, of course, translation of a Dalit feminist. I would call it Dalit omenist. Prefer the term omenist, Dalit omenist in, in fiery poetry into English. And one autobiography. For me, autobiography is a savior of history. Through autobiography, we come to know the history of the nation, history of the state, state politics, and the sociology of the time and how all political parameters operate into that. For this, I stop here. I begin to go to the next piece. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you both very much. So maybe before we start uh, looking at the first migration and the arts part of, of, of the discussion, Maybe we start by looking at uh, at what is happening with uh, with Dalits. What are the issues? How do the issues arise? Uh, what are the causes? And how how uh, are, are Dalits being affected? So Ambrose, like if you ask me, like uh, uh, I have been in the academic field for the last seven years, I would say. And before that, I was into petroleum engineering. And while growing up, uh, I was a theater practitioner and I used to live in Delhi. So while I, I was growing up, I realized that there was a bifurcation, which you could see, like it wasn't a hidden thing. The bifurcation was visible. And most of the like entitled privileged people in India were much more inclined toward making their children. And it, it was same with me also. And it, with most of the middle-class people in India, like their parents are much more inclined toward sending their kids to either become engineer and doctor rather than getting indulged into these social activities like humanities or something like that so that you can understand how your society is getting developed. We were always put it away from that. And it's happening with most of them. Like that's why India is producing most number of engineers and doctors that they don't want people to understand what's the reality, like a hierarchy, which is prevailing. And as I was in theater, I knew a bit about this thing, but 
once I completed my engineering, I wanted to understand more about this thing. And then I went into Bihar and understand about this Bidesia performance as I am from Bihar. So I knew about Bhikari Thakur, but again, it was quite taboo. And it happened with me when I started researching about Bhikari Thakur, many people, used, I was a bit surprised. Like I knew caste exists, but I didn't knew like in post-colonial India, it exists in such a blatant way. And people were asking me why you are interested in researching about Bhikari Thakur. Like, he used to cross-dress and cross-dress performance. Uh, it's called London, actually, like cross-dress dance performance, which is quite popular and being popularized by Bhikari Thakur only. But uh, there was a, a way of seeing that thing in a much more, I would say, like in an obscene way, like why you want to research about someone. He's not like a Shakespeare or something like that. Even if you want to do research, go to the NSD and do research about some of this, like classical performers who are performing. So the dividend was, was quite clear. Like it wasn't even like, nobody was trying to sugarcoat it. They were quite blatant about it. So I started researching about this thing. And while researching uh, during my master's at Holloway, I understand that there are, within this boundary only, when performance is being produced, there are different kind of resistance it is producing and especially when it's come to Dalit performance and their context like context I'm talking about their stories you don't have to even put it like in a face something just you have to pick that story and there is a kind of resistance which is being produced because we are talking about a community which has been marginalized for thousand years it's not like new something which suddenly developed so the resistance they have produced that resistance and that's what makes them different when India was colonized. Because when India was colonized, most of the upper caste, when they felt threatened by the Britishers and when their resistance were producing, most of those resistance which were produced were kind of a mimic. Like they were trying to follow British, like Western community. And in response, they are producing those resistance, something what Homi Baba has also mentioned. But when these Dalit community are performing their resistance, it's something psychologically they are much more uh like i would say they are much more advanced because they have felt that trauma for a long time so there is a certain resistance which has not been highlighted and when i completed my masters and uh when I went into the details of bidesia i found there are different bidesias and some of the bidesias are basically funded by government only so that the even their resistance is something what government want them to produce. Like even taking those ideas also, like which used to give them a kind of boost, a moral boost. So I was a bit surprised. And then I started like, we need a kind of a model that could analyze all kind of, instead of putting them in the binary of purity and impurity, we need an, a proper model that could analyze where, when the purity start and when, because, if we are going to divide this community only, the resistance is like if we are giving a keys of uh, keys to the, in the uh, hand of all those majoritarian people. Like if we are going to divide these resistance, so we need that model. And uh, from there onwards, this idea came out from my mind. So yeah, this was about me. Yeah, I, I take it from him. It's really an opportunity to work with the Dalits. And what I realized is that the, the democratization of knowledge that has taken place in last two, three decades gave an endless platform for the expression uh, of thought and which catalyzed the Dalit activism and waved all forms of Dalit social movements into one larger emancipatory space. What I am uh, concerned with is that how uh, they were den uh, denied of prominence and uh, the skill of resistance through expression, through verbal, uh, through social behavior, and through the code of writings. And if we look into the university pattern, the syllabus was uh, full of the Brahminical syllabus, a product of knowledge of the Brahman, that means who are in the center. And they are the maker of the syllabus and they are the planner of the syllabus. From when a child is born, actually they are under the spell of this Brahminical knowledge system and they inherit it. So they are unconsciously become a part of the uh, knowledge system, which is 
are largely dominated by the upper caste. You know, the issue of Dalit is unique to India because very difficult for an outsider to understand or fathom the uh, pyramid of caste in India because it's a very complex issue even in, in India, very hard to understand and the state-wise it differs. And interestingly, in my state in West Bengal, there are so many castes that come under Dalits. You know, I am not considering Pidule tribe as Dalits because they are ethnic and they are a very different race. But there are so many definitions that who are the Dalits in India and who are not Dalits in India. And there are schools of definitions for that. There are schools of definitions for me. Maharashtran school of def definition that is the movement took place in 1970s, the Dalit Panther movement. They looked at it from a different angle. In 1950s, with a liberal ideology under the spell of the Marxist uh, ideology, the conception was more liberal. Even the women were considered as Dalits in that definition. But you know, scheduled tribe is very difficult to place under Dalits because it has an yeah, a ethnological part to it, ethnic tribes, and they don't take Ambedkar as a model because B. R. Ambedkar and Fule, they are the stalwarts and who pioneered and championed the cause of the Dalits. And, uh, you know, followers of Ambedkar, that is Ambedkarite scholars, Ambedkar writers, Fuleite writers, Fuleite scholars, you know, they don't match with the the idea of the ethnicity, the only people, tribes from coming from the northeast of India. Northeast of India is a, is a very interesting part where you know, the tribes come into force. And India is such a country, the beauty of India is the coexistence of so many castes and you know, so many creed coming from different backgrounds and working under one umbrella. And uh, why I call it very difficult to fathom the, uh, the details of caste in India, because if I consider in my state only, there are so many castes that come under the uh, under Dalits, like Namashudra. Namashudra is a big community in West Bengal. Uh, they, call, they are Dalits and they are fighting uh, for their space, craving for space for a long time. <laughs> and sorry, if we look into the university system that I'm talking about the, in the schools, colleges, universities, if you go back 25 years ago, there is no space for that. And mostly it was, it was, you know, it was considered not to match with the Brahminical production of good literature and so that way. But in the last two, two decades, things have changed uh, literally. And a lot of interest have taken place in academia to introduce the Dalit texts as Dalit texts within the curriculum, and which has made a great interest to work on the Dalits in different parts of India and also outside the paradigm, um, that means in a diasporic space or in a foreign, can, uh, in foreign space. Now, what is interesting about the Dalits, because, you know, there is a criticism about the subaltern writings that they always talk about their own life, their own narration. There are hardly good you know, literary value into it. I strongly oppose it because I find a lot of interesting, a lot of, you know, multifaceted, multi-talented writers in the subaltern communities, subaltern uh, writers who are writers of resistance. Dalit writers writing and engaging us from different corners of India. And what is interesting is their varied thoughts and they're so different and they put into uh, a new mythology, new position of definition of us, the identity. So identity of a man is not that we all, all are always Brahminical. So if, we, if someone considers man, in an Indian context, is all Brahminical, is a Persian living. So the identity, when the identity has been constructed, that means a Dalit is also a man. And uh, how 
uh, when we talk about define India, I think we need to define India from the perspective of Mahatma Gandhi, from the perspective of Jahala Nehru. At the same time, the definition of India will be incomplete if we don't uh, refer to B.R. Ambedkar and Sule. My contestation to the Brahminical, only one pocketed system of knowledge is that knowledge stemming from different sources constitute the identity of, of someone. And uh, my co-panelist al has always hinted at, there are platforms for social reform. One of the major powerful platform, platforms is literary production. And literary production should not be confined to the regional domain only. It, it should be in this world of digitization. It should be available digitally and in translations in different languages. I will urge who are present in this particular forum and, and the audience in an audience and panel, how this Dalit literature can be made available in all languages that we know in the world so that people can come to know about their scales of writing, their scales of, uh, of engagement, the areas of resistance, and how they're coping up with the changing demands of time and putting on the identity marker. The identity is very important because now, you know, I believe that no one can deny the sun rising, isn't it? The sun rising is a matter of process. So no one can say knowledge is my own property. So democratization of literature, democratization of literacy and knowledge and the mass education has given the voice to the Dalits who can write fearlessly and who can express fearlessly. I think it's a really an, a wonderful, it's a kind of wonderful opportunity for of us to read the Dalits, to read about the Dalits, and work with the Dalits. And I think working on Dalits is a part of activism. Of course, over to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you both. Thank you very much. And uh, what, what, what is, or what has been happening around uh, Dalits and forced migration? Um, if you ask uh, with my perspective, like, as I mentioned, like I will define forced when I say forced. For me, forced is not like, it's something like you forcefully just sent someone from one, uh, uh, like, from one part of the world to another part. I use force, especially in my research, when I'm uh, defining the binary of purity and impurity, I use force there. And for me, force is sometimes it's like giving kind of um, uh, an idea that you could have a very dignified life from where you are living. And as I mentioned, like uh, during uh, 1927, uh, between 1845 to 1927, when people used to migrate from the eastern part of Bihar and UP to the Caribbean islands and Trinidad, this was their idea. Like you could have a very wonderful life because they have a very pathetic life here when they were living. So giving a kind of idea, okay, instead of living here, you could go there. I also use the force, the terminology force for that also because it's a kind of a, mischievous a trickery kind of thing because they went there as a slaves only and their lifestyle wasn't that a kind of a prestigious kind of lifestyle they weren't living till now also uh, most of the Dalit community who have migrated from Suriname to Netherlands also and when I went for my field work and I met them there is a certain kind of difference when it comes to the perspective of a local Dutch community toward the people of Suriname who have migrated from the Suriname and the people of India who are the first generation migrant. So the same Dutch community has a different perspective for those two communities. So on an artistic level, I find it quite interesting. Like they are quite close knitted community when it's come to like taking all those heritage close to their, themselves. Like uh, London Arch over which I'm doing research is a cross dress transform, which uh, as a whole talks about the story of migration and the evils of migration and the social evils of caste. But the London Arch has become a, a different kind of dance form 
especially in Netherlands, and these Bhojpuri members, Bhojpuri community, who are most of them are Dalits, uh, have been performing this in a very small community. There are almost 50 groups. And they have been performing this thing since uh, when they were in Suriname also and after migrating to Suriname also. So one of the performers have told me like after 1950, they were the first group who, the first group. And at present, there are almost 50 groups who performs every weekend. Like they have the job also, but on every weekend they perform this dance form as a ritual in marriages, in birthday. And it's helped. One of the reasons it's, it's helped to maintain the close-knitted community. And the second reason is that the resistance which are, they are producing, and uh, I'm uh, pointing out in my research also, like how sometimes it's also some subconscious kind of resistance. Like I met few of the artists uh, who, despite not knowing like what big steps they are taking, they, they perform in temples. Like if you ask at present also, there are many Dalits who are not allowed to go into the temple, but they are producing this dance form, which on a present time in Bihar, eastern part of India, is seen as an obscene dance form. But the same dance form in Netherlands, performed by the same community members from the Bhojpuri region, they are performing in the temple and it's seen as a, like a ritual, which is very compulsory before marriage. So it was quite fascinating to find out like there are different layers, like on a social levels, they are not that much accepted within the outside community but within their community they have accepted all their cultural heritage which at the same time in India on a comparative analysis basis it's seen as an obscene dance form so yeah it's quite fascinating how this forceful migration of a Dalit community is being presented in our present socio-cultural environment how about you, Jaydeep? What 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 are your thoughts on uh, on forced migration and 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 Dalits? Yeah, that's wonderful to listen to him, and uh, of course, it's certainly very important because two very important things has happened have happened. One is partition, the partition of India, and the partition of Eastern part, that means Bengal partition, Red Cliff Line. And you know, on the basis of the caste they are coming from, and they have been rehabilitated under the dole system of the government of India in different parts of India. And one of them is, of course, uh, Dandakaranya. Dandakaranya is a place where the living is, uh, is, is uh, always dangerous. And they were forced to not to come. If you are coming from a lower caste in Bangladesh after partition, you are relocated into Dandakarana and some refugee camps and in, in an intermediate stage, you now like Punti Transit Camp, Shiromani Camp, and the and you know uh, the and the community they grow up in Dandakarana and other places later on. So you know the dole system and the politics of the central central politics of the state you know the kind of forced migration gives birth to the you know, uh, a kind of another uh, resistance uh, we within the format of society that they build up their society over there the community over there in last 50 years or 70 years of time and one generation to another generation. And that happens through in pan-Indian scale, entire Indian scale. So where can you go if you can go to uh, go and work in, in different inhuman conditions? No, you are bound to work in that. And one generation to another generation because largely it is very difficult to come out of it but things have changed i won't say that uh, it's not that you no know, now there are a lot of provisions for under reservation called reservation of job reservations of different scales of reservations under uh, educational sectors some are excelling very fast but of course the mentality and the liberal ways of 
education, interactions with uh, proper knowledge, and uh, I'll say, you know, the building up the cultural competence is very important. Cultural competence, know your neighbor and you respect your neighbor. Your neighbor is also a dignified member of an Indian society, of a new Indian society. And forced migration, as he has already mentioned in different parts of the world, that from India, they went there and the migration also took place within India. Ah, that is also very important because many people can, could not go out. And as he mapped out very well that many went out in Suriname, in West Indies, Guyana, and different places, of course. Similarly, within India, there is a some suppose someone who needs a job, someone who needs some kind of uh, survival in life. You know, they want to go to Mumbai because if you can end up in Mumbai, you can earn something by uh, giving your labor. You know, uh, and uh, in that space, of course, uh, even in, within Cal Kolkata, the city of Kolkata, where I am located one person has already commented the to share my location my location i come from west bengal and uh, the city of joy kolkata and uh, my position is of course uh, 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 i am a human being and that position is i am an academic i am a researcher and i am a professor on marginal studies and marginal discourse and this migration forced migration also involves a kind of uh, space and territory was shaped towards on the banks of the rivers. I mean, on the banks of the rivers means many cities and the uh, cities and the places of industries are based on the uh, on on the banks of the rivers, major rivers, as it is in in the space of entire civilization in all countries. But in this. Of, there is another thing that is involved in that, that they can cultivate land and they can earn something for that. And uh, when someone is coming from Bangladesh as for under forced migration category to Bengal, they don't have, and he or she has no shelter. She has nothing to, uh, and nothing for living and all that. So see, he, begin, he or she begins from nearly zero. And we now have the evidence of that they have excelled in life and they have also made, uh, um, made a lot of progress in their lifestyle, of course. But at the same time, there this is not the entire picture. That is, there are also communities who could not move within this parameter. I'm talking about within the Dalit communities and they are still in a very... Uh, remote areas and really, really, their survival is a big stake. And so, uh, forced migration took place also in the forest areas, and the deforestation has taken out their life. You know, so I'll say it sucked out life from that. So many tribes are homeless, and they are they are actually losing out their own tradition because their the lifestyle is being snatched away from themselves and also the ways of living the ways of survival their modes of survival are no more i know the the same tradition is going on rapid growth of industrialization a rapid growth of cyber technology and people uh, you know and democratization of education so people have started learning, accepting the new cultural space. And in a new cultural space, I think the who is migrating from where is not important. The play and the identity is where you are, where you end up. So it's a very interesting issue to look at it, historical perspective. But th those who suffered, uh, really, uh, it has a painful history to record. Thank you. And also uh, looking at some of the, it's, 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 it's been in, in uh, all your, both your contributions so far, but looking at it uh, and maybe possibly, you know, zooming out a little bit before 
we come back to the individual, to the different art forms that you focus on. Uh, what are you seeing around Dalits and the arts in general? Um, uh, I would answer your question, Ambrose, but uh, I just thought, and Jadeep also mentioned there was one question about the position, positionality and where from I am. So as I mentioned, like uh, I am a graduate teaching assistant at DMU right now. I am a theater activist and I'm an atheist. So one of the things like I call myself like I'm an Ambedkarite. So one of the things has been mentioned by Ambedkar like before challenging the idea of caste hierarchy, it's Hindu scriptures. There are many ideas of Hindu scriptures that are quite irrational about the casteism. So you have to counter that thing. And I believe like the first step, uh, it's something like caste is too hard to remove that thing. And when you challenge that thing, uh, some I called myself as a critical insider also because it's quite relevant. Being a privilege, people can call like being a privilege. You can say like, okay, I can put my caste aside. And that's also because I am a privilege. I am belonging from that caste. So that's why I call myself an atheist. I I presume the idea of Ambedkar, what Ambedkar called, like you have to remove those content that puts your mentality into those supremacy kind of idea. So uh, I call myself as Ambedkarite and position myself as an Ambedkarite. Uh, regarding your question, like about the present situation of uh, Dalits in the art, it's uh, Jadif has also mentioned like uh, in literature also and uh, me from performing arts field, I've seen like there are different arts form which has been coming out, especially from the Dalit perspective, performed by Dalits and represented by Dalits. But here comes like a catch-22 kind of situation. When these community performed on a different levels, sometimes they have been called out like mimicking most of the classical modern performance. When they are being funded by government, they are asked to like perform as the government wishes, which are seen as a majoritarian viewpoint. Then when they are performing and they don't want even as a cultural appropriation being part of their culture, they still re remain relevant to the rural sites of uh, perspective so that their ideas does not come out in a similar way how the classical modern performances ideas used to come out even in the diaspora culture so it's quite tough and as i mentioned like there are different hierarchies within the dalit performance also so sometimes dalit performance accepts those economic benefits also which is being given by government just to make those changes in the folk culture there are many uh, folk performance who does not accept that idea but their style remain in that community only and then there are people who are like fighting in between these two binaries, whether to make changes or whether to protect their culture. And then it's the diaspora culture. So even in diaspora, only those performances are being appreciated, which are mostly being seen as funded by the government or appropriated, or I would say the term I would use as a cultural taste, a Canosas, like majoritarian canosas. So those which has been accepted by majoritarian canosas has been accepted within the diaspora culture also. So the artist form, there are people who are using it as a resistance also, but it has been accepted on a large scale. No, it has not been accepted. It has been funded by government in a way they are want to project themselves. No, it has not been. It has been funded. There are many relevant uh, subsidiaries. There are many different ideas also, which has been given by the uh, government or by different philanthropists also. But in those ideas, they have to make many alterations. The same thing is not being presented. And that's the issue. The same thing which is being presented still at the rural level, at, at a marginalized level. So I don't know. There is resistance, but the resistance remain within the community only. So it's something which need to be detailed 
analysis and that's what I'm doing uh, with the performance analysis model. And it's quite interesting, like if you go into the detail, how within that community only different kind of hierarchies have been developed. So it's kind of like what during the colonial period used to have divide and rule policies kind of thing. The same community has been funded also and the same community is being pushed back by saying like, okay, uh, you are kind of creating impurity within the Hinduism. And then those community who want to fight with the help of theater, they remain at the rural level because they are neither accepting those ceremonies given by the government, nor they are trying to make any changes. So yeah, it's quite fascinating thing, but there are artists, there are performance. And the only thing is it's need to be analyzed with a model that analyzes all those hierarchies. Yeah, I join with him. That is wonderful. Uh, of course, you know, Dalit identity-based politics and the art form give, go hand in hand. You know, why do we call Dalit identity-based politics? Because <clears throat> in there are so many caste groups and, you know, so many communities and uh, the performance is one space where uh, the identity is exhibited and what sort of identity is exhibited at as my co-panelist has already hinted at the Ambedkarite group of uh, of writers the dramatists and uh, also the literary uh, I'll say the writers they have come up with a literature and the stuff which go for a total change in society for good and uh, the upliftment of a caste or a class section of society through the performance and that is quite an amazing uh, thing within India. What is important here is intersectional uh, pattern of cultural modes of living. When you are an Indian you have so many intersectional facets go into the making of your uh, functional production of your text material as well as on stage device. If you are performing an art form, of course, all those go into the intersectional materials. That means if you are coming from a Tamil, Tamil Nadu, you are Tamil, then your uh, Dalit identity, if you are a Dalit, and Dalit from where a Christian Dalit, if you are a woman, there is another space, cultural space to it, dimension to it. I'm thinking about a great Dalit activist, come writer, feminist, or you can say womanist, Bama, Bama Fasema. If you read my interviews with Bama, you know, where she talked about her identity and her areas of appropriation, or I'll call it intersectional feminism. And how intersectional feminism is that, how one and another sections meet in the cultural paradigm. You know, all Dalit uh, productions, or I'll say Dalit uh, activities, as well as uh, the art forms are craving towards social justice activity, activism. I call them as social justice activism because through them, a society is demanding justice. The age-old practice wants to be changed and they need to be reformed and reformed for good. And there are several patriarchal powers within the Dalit groups also. So when we think of a Dalit production or <clears throat> Dalit art form, there are so many other matters they go make into the intersectional cultural paradigms into the making of the production available. When we define uh, uh, some production as Dalit, we think that it is made for social change because it is a cultural production and it is also political, political in a sense that it, it, it goes for the making 
for something very fresh. You know, when we talk about the contemporary discourse, there is a generation coming up who can, who who is confident in speaking English, speaking uh, vernacular, and they are uh, well educated, and they are first generation, second generation, uh, university uh, goers, and all that, and they have read the theories very well. Therefore, they know how to express the theories into production. So when we talk about, suppose, a Dalit song or a Dalit drama or a Dalit theater, some Dalit Jatra. Jatra is a form uh, which is very local, very regional in different remote villages that take place and they take, take up any incident social event, or social ways of life, where uh, suppose a reform can be hinted at through these performances. I call a text is a text which has the power of social reform because all the texts are, I'll say, full of explosive possibilities for reforming a society for good. You know, a society that means we we are born with certain systems and stereotypes. Breaking the barriers, breaking the stereotypes are the call for the art. And within the art, it is not that the art is always a manifesto, manifesto of something. The art, is, one part of the art is, of course, the cry for justice. That is a social justice activism. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, my other question is uh, building on that: is uh, what what are you seeing in relation to film, music, theater, photography, visual arts uh, around uh, Dalit voice and also Dalit representation? Uh, it's a very interesting question. Like uh, people times when I go for conference, like when you are developing a performance analysis model, why that could not analyze, uh, especially in terms of Dalits in Bollywood. And Bollywood seen as a popular culture of India, uh, which is quite counterable. Like, I don't agree with this argument, like Bollywood should be seen as a popular culture of India. On a many perspective, they have their own kind of elitism when it's come to questioning or raising the issues of subaltern uh, but it's very hard like when it's come to the mainstream uh, I would say still there is a kind of elitism exist but when it's come to like photography and uh, visual like there are many YouTube channels uh, where Dalits Dalits themselves are coming out like they don't need anyone to represent them they, they themselves are coming out there are very great scholars who are representing their voice and uh, it's it's quite interesting uh, when you see different areas other than the theater also like as i mentioned in theater i found it's a bit surprising like how they are themselves divided but it when it comes to visual arts when it comes to academic when it's come to photography and uh, other than the bollywood like uh, as i told you i would remove that thing as a part of popular culture because they are they are quite stereotyped when it's come to the raising the issues of marginalized and subaltern. But other than that, uh, there is independent voice which is coming out and it's quite progressive and quite threatening also for the majoritarian ideas. And and Jadip, what, what what are you seeing in uh in, in terms of uh like uh, theater, music, film, photography, visual arts in relation to Dalit voice and representation. Yeah, that is, uh, I exactly um, endorse my co-panelist here. Uh, and now with the digitization, uh, knowledge is not limited to one. Knowledge is available to all. And knowledge is also can be, knowledge can be accessed anyone from any geographical location. It's not that you live in urban space and you are uh, you, you can only access to knowledge. 
if you can be in a rural remote rural space uh, and you can be a good user of the internet the space of internet what i mean to say is that the things have changed and new technology and uh, the age of uh, cyber security the age of you know, use of cyber cyberspace in this particular age the distance is uh, minimum and it's no one can say that i am denied because of my geographical location and my position in society so this is very interesting and i am very uh, happy to see that many dalit photographers are using the cyberspace maximum and uh, promoting their own space and making us uh, uh, aware of their angles and gauges of life that is important because how do you look at life with your background your your, uh, your eyes are a package of uh, bundles of different parameters one of them is education one of them is your heritage another one is your background social political caste background how do you look at it and how do you angle your photo into the making and also the film that you are talking about dalits are put dalits were used to portray to be portrayed as depressed class the class you know you know they uh, they are almost uh, they were untouchable as portrayed but now if you look into that many progressive filmmakers have taken the role uh, taken uh, the lead and the camera which is very important character in a in a in particular film because what the camera shows us we can see and the camera is non brahmical the brahmanical that means things are changing that camera is showing that uh, from the periphery not from the center always so the when we talk about the dalits there is always a stigma that we always talk about socio economical oppression but you know there are other ways of uh, emancipation and you know space of emancipatory space and dalits are engaged in you know, all art forms and they have excelled in all art forms and a generation of university goers college goers they are the confident nation builders they are the confident globe builders i'll say in all aspects of the art and no one can say that a dalit only can write one particular genre and they are genre, and they are not confident with other genres of their writing but not that they are capable of anything that makes them happy what make me happy is important it's my choice what ways i will take i will select it's my identity through which i speak thank you yeah and and then uh picking up on uh on on what what both of you are saying what what would you say uh what what would you say what responsibilities would you say activists artists academics people who work with artists what would you say what responsibility do they have in relation to to dalits in relation to forced migration in the arts uh, the one thing i uh, i was quite clear in my initial days only like they should be truthful like they should not utilize the word dalit just for their benefit and what we in academic word we call cultural appropriation when people like even from a uh, western perspective are writing or working over a dalit culture or people from india only if they are not dalit and they are working over this thing if you are raising an issue as an activist or in any way the first thing you should be you should be truthful to their cause it's not like you should get all those benefits and eclats rather than working for them and it's uh, when i uh, mentioned to you like how uh, bollywood is seen as a popular culture but they are stereotyping this thing the same thing they are doing like instead of like it's very hard to find a big celebrity who is dalit in a bollywood and when you are raising all these issue and everything and you themselves are not quite capable of following those ideas then it's become quite tough like okay you might call yourself any sort of activist but if you are not following that line 
it's much more like getting all those benefits rather than working for that cause. So if you are calling yourself an activist, be truthful to those person whose cause or whose voice you are becoming. So this is my idea. Yeah, this is very interesting, fascinating question. Uh, relating oneself with the art performance and migration process of migration leading to the emancipatory role in society. That is uh, the process through which a society makes a progressive step. And I always think Dalit production as humanist production because it works towards human and it is made by human and it's the human literature and human art and human art who are the audience of the course for the human audience. And uh, what is unique to this is that the gaze that adds beauty to the overall competence of a society. A society is, uh, is formed with all life and people from all sections. And how do they gaze at life? And life and art, they walk side by side. And uh, life cannot be divorced from society and art. And life, society, and art, they three are like three brothers working hand in hand for a, a society, social progress. Uh, I say that Dalit art is, of course, the, it is the art of any, like any common human heart, because it's made by human and the audience is human and the representation of the life lived in the in this society. And the equal and equity of something is to be earned and achieved. And the equity is not given at times. So this the yeah the idea of equity in society, I'll say, comes from the idea of inclusivity or inclusiveness. And through inclusiveness, we come to embrace the fact of living that our together living is a joint process of looking at things. That means we all look at things together from one perspective and the gauges may be different, our baggages may be different, our expressions may be different, but our aptitude, attitude and our ways of uh, ide uh, identification are are homogeneous. You know, it's uh, there is a whole lot of tendency of uh, bracketing one under one homo homogenized group. But of course, within the variety is of course within the uh, within this space adds beauty to it because it's very fortunate we are that we learn the mosaics of culture and we are born in a culture that is so varied and uh, sends multilingual multicultural india and dalit is also a perspective and dalit is also uh, a, a, an important part of our living whether living lived experience or experience of my neighbor. That means I relate it to myself or my competence in a relation with others. So when we talk about the art productions, a production or art is the manifest, it's all, not always a manifesto, but of course, the survival is the most important thing in life. When survival is at stake, that comes to the forefront. Therefore, majority of uh, writings are autobiographical. They want to narrate their own stories of living and how their stories of, uh, you know, I'll say, uh, of from zero to the prominence because how society was 
terrible on them how social forces political forces and the forces of the ancestral ancestral forces and the legacy were too cruel to them they want to share with that but of course the beauty lies with the overall assessment of the gauges through which a society is actually takes us forward so i am very optimistic about um, the dalit writings dalit theory uh, dalit productions dalit art these days because uh, uh, of a no new knowledge system knowledge available to all has given a confident uh, uh, confident bunch of people who can really think uh, society and change society for good if they need to thank, thank, thank you thank you very much and then uh, <clears throat> we we've got a, a number of uh, questions in the chat um, we've got a question from swati actually yeah a question from swati uh, two questions from Swati, one question from Karen. Would, uh, would you like to, to speak to your questions, uh, Swati and Karen? Hi, thank you, Ambrosi. Is that a correct pronunciation of your name? It is fine. It is fine. Ambrosi is fine. Yes, thank you. Uh, right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks to the speakers. Um, when I asked about social location, I uh, specifically meant in the Indian context, uh, the caste location one comes from. And I ask that uh, because uh, as a person of uh, oppressed caste background, you don't have choice to call yourself uh, other names than your caste location because your caste location is identified. Uh, I come from an oppressed caste background, so um, that's why I wanted to know when the speakers speak uh, about or write about or produce knowledge about um, the people of uh, who have experienced oppression, um, how do they uh, position themselves and what reflections have gone in uh, while producing this knowledge about their own positionality and do they lay it out uh, uh, at the forefront. Um, thank you, Satkriti, for uh, uh, your uh, comments, uh, direct comments in the chat. Uh, my second question was about the artists he's been working with, uh, both in Sur Suriname and, I mean, Suriname artists who are in the Netherlands and the Indian artists, but due to uh, ethical uh, reasons, uh, the names could not be shared, but probably I'll get to know more uh, when we connect as well. Uh, but I wanted to uh, put this forth here that there is a long standing anti caste uh, tradition history uh, of knowledge production, and it goes beyond uh, only acknowledging one as uh, human because everybody can use that language. Uh, and in the current world that we live in, uh, there is a political correctness uh, where everybody can claim, lay claim to saying we are for social justice, we are for equality, but at the same time, that language is used to be part of a certain woke, quote unquote, milieu. So one needs to really, really understand that when we are talking about a certain community, we uh, do justice to it uh, by uh, at least having, if I may say so, uh, a spe one speaker from the community itself. Knowledge can be produced, research can be done on the communities. Are these research done in collaboration? Uh, are the researchers who uh, are, whose work has been um, researched, are they uh, acknowledged? Are they uh, cited? Um, for example, 
which performers are we talking about from India? There are so many, several filmmakers uh, from uh, the northern part of India. You have Neeraj Ghevan. In the southern part, you have um, uh, Bhimji. Uh, I mean to say, um, uh, oh my God, I forget the name right now. But uh, um, uh, yeah, so you have several uh, artists um, on digital platforms as well. Um, you have younger folks about who Jaydeep says, but it would be interesting to like lay what important works that have created these democratic conversations, uh, helping democratization, challenging the status quo in the current uh, political scenario where uh, there is a very strong sort of identity politics that is going on from the Hindutva perspective, the nationalist perspective. So we need to also talk about that and how Dalit suppression takes place in the university spaces, how, uh, you know, the speaker Jaydeep spoke about uh, the affirmative action helping, but in contemporary uh, scene, we see that in these educational institutions, uh, be it institutions for technology studies, IITs of India, I am uh, the, prestigious universities, uh, the scholars entering in, students entering in, face tremendous amount of challenges. So even when you uh, fight for your rights, you claim your rights, you enter these spaces, which are supposed to be democratic spaces, knowledge spaces, you face discrimination. And these sorts of issues needs to be spoken about. Migration, in fact, uh, Ambedkar said, wherever uh, the Hindu society will migrate, travel, they will take caste along with them. And that has that is what has happened in contemporary times, be it from the uh, colonial time where indentured laborers were taken from India to uh, different parts of the world. You have Fijian scholar, uh, Asha Pillai, with whom I had a panel uh, conversation last month. And she talks about the Fijian communities. You have Suriname communities that Satkirti talks about. And there is so much layers and complexities of identity formation, identity erasure, uh, cultural erasure, cultural appropriation, and all these uh, nuances uh, needs to be spoken of when we speak of migration. So, uh, so uh, thank you for uh, giving me this space. Maybe we can engage further in the conversation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Swati. Um, I, do, I don't know if uh, Satriti and uh, Jadip, you, you want to respond to Swati's comments. No, I completely like uh, when Swati have started. I completely agree, and that's why I mentioned this thing. It's very important when you are talking about, especially a subaltern community. You need to position yourself. Like you could do whatever for that community as an academician, as a activist, or everything. But there are certain binaries which is going to tag along with you. And that's why I mentioned, like, I might call myself as an atheist, but that's also my privilege position, which is giving me that privilege notion. And there would be better person if there would be a Dalit scholar who could define that thing. I am working with an idea to achieve certain things, but I have that privilege, which I will carry. <laughs> uh, despite saying like I am an atheist or humanist and whatever, like even if you just say like, okay, uh, we are coming out with different affirmative actions, but those affirmative actions are not enough and it's never going to be enough. The truth is like, because it has been reinterpreted by the same power which want to be at the top. For instance, like uh, what happening in India right now with the Hindutva idea, like the people who are supporting Hindutva idea in India, the same people who are going outside and being seen as the followers of Mahatma Gandhi. So it's like the people who are in power, they are churning out all these kind of notions. So whether calling myself as atheist or whether Jadeep call himself as a humanist or whether we are talking about affirmative actions, but are they enough? It's 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 a debatable, and I quite agree with Swati. Like uh, uh, even when we have a panel, it's very important to have a Dalit scholar and Dalit academicians regarding this thing. But there are people who are taking steps, and we should accept that thing also. Like as as I mentioned, like I I if 
if you would ask me, like I could relate with anyone, I I would always relate with Ambedkar. So I don't know whether the caste in which I was born, how could I remove that thing? But I re relate myself with an Ambedkar and that's why I'm so much into this cause. No, solidarity comes with that, uh, you know, uh, acknowledgement, respect and those steps and reflections that take place. Uh, as well as we need to be very much aware of, are we in this form of allyship or solidarity falling in the trap of saviorism, yeah. you know? So that's that's very, very important when one comes from a privileged location that yeah. they have to always understand that my reflections, my need to work with the community who is marginalized, oppressed, comes from this premise that, you know, as a human, we work towards social justice that no one is equal until everybody is so that if that is the premise then what is my next step am i being a savior am i having this uh you know compassion uh you know a sort of uh, uh, self-congratulatory compassion yeah. that am i portraying so, uh, that's why I mention it's like even if the people who are quite privileged and working over the uh, ideas of subalterns, whether in theater or in different performing, arts, they should be truthful to the cause rather than just showing themselves, okay, we are here to help. Like they, they wouldn't make any sense. Like hey, we are here to help, but we are just using that cause for our own benefits. They should be truthful to that cause rather than just being benevolent in their own land. Like, okay, we are there to help. Thank, thank, thank you. And uh, Jadip, what, what you, you, your thoughts? Yeah, it, it's really uh, true. Suppose uh, I also have seen the same thing, um, experienced the same thing what Shati and uh, my co-panelists have said. Uh, suppose, uh, think of the any marginal community and uh, uh, if you are not an insider to that marginal community and if you are uh, involved in, uh, you know, I will say, uh, or researching on that or act of translation on that, or you are um, actually, going into that knowledge system in some kind of knowledge system that's a challenge for uh, the person for that it's almost like suppose uh, i cannot say um, um, of, of, of the australian aborigines i talk very um, uh, pertinently that uh, when uh, you are an outsider to that you are uh, you are not an aborigine you are not an Australian even, and how you work with them and how you uh, carry it forward and what role you have, because you don't have primary uh, experience of it, living experience of an Aborigine or as well as an Australian, similarly. But it comes to uh, that, uh, uh, of course, how faithful you can be and uh, how togetherness with the text you can produce. Suppose a Brahman translating a text of a Dalit. And uh, that is that was a whole lot of practice uh, because of the knowledge system. Uh, of course, I have seen in my visits to Australia, the Aborigines productions are actually edited by the white Australian professors who are, who are actually the British descendants, not uh, Aborigines. Similarly, most of the translators, uh, renowned translators, renowned or not renowned, I would say, but they are, of course, uh, they uh, they are not Dalits, but translated Dalit texts into English. In my life also, if you check my background, I translate a lot of texts which are very different from my living conditions. I was not born like that. But I had no chance of, uh, of that, first-hand experience of that. So what I try to do in my textual reproduction, uh, working with those texts from the vernacular to making them available in English, is living together, trying to produce an approximate text. 
and trying to use language as close to the text in vernacular. If I use my academic jargon into that, there will be thrice removed from the text. So it's a challenge and no translation, I humbly say, is the definite one. I always say, claim that there are other ways to work with the book, isn't it? Suppose I am a male, I cannot experience the female. And if we write a book on female, it's always my ideology will be secondary ideology. Of course, the first hand and the second hand, there is some sort of difference, has to be different, isn't it? Because the kind of uh, you know, first hand production is always something uh, very uh, rare and very something very special. But of course, those working with the secondary material on the productions, of course, we also call them artists because we need both of them to make the society progress. You know, uh, we don't need the shoulders of each and every one for the cause, but of course, definitely uh, the first generation, second generation, third generation, fourth generation, Aborigines will translate Aborigine texts into English in a better way. This is my humble submission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know, Swati, uh, is there anything you'd like to add or respond to? Uh, thank you, uh, Ambrose. Uh, I think Anoop has a question. Uh, maybe it would be uh, better to engage with that question. I will come back after that question. Yes, okay. thank you. So, so uh, before, before we, we, we had uh, a few questions from Karen. Uh, Karen, would you like to, to speak to your questions? I actually feel they were well answered um, um, by part, it, partly by the uh, question <laughs> and response to uh, uh, Sawi, um, Sawadi. I'm sorry, I pronounced that incorrectly. Um, but there was another question that maybe you want to have a look at. Um, thank you. Great okay. presentation. <laughs> okay. So um, looking at uh, the questions again, we've got another one from, okay, we have Swati from Anup. Anup, would you like to, to speak to your question? Yes, um, I apologize in advance if you hear any children screaming in the background. So that's just, I thought I'd put that out there for now. Um, so I think it was just more of a, a me sort of having an open think really uh, about the inclusion of, of Dalit groups. And again, I, engaged um, engaging in research within this space um again with 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 scholars and and other individuals who uh, self-identify as Dalit um hearing stories hearing those narratives it, it do you feel and I think this this question is for Satkiti as well as as Swati as well and for and for Jayadeep is could there be is there a fear sometimes of the tokenism or this fetishization amongst or within the cultural industries to include, you know, Dalit artists, filmmakers, for example? So it, it's basically me going off what Swati was mentioning earlier about research, trying to be non-extractive um, in its approach, but also thinking about the process of research. So when we think about, you know, the, these again, anecdotal points you know who's at the table who's not at the table who do we want at the table and it's almost like you know the hot topics in the name of social justice what's going to get me published what's going to get me noticed who's who doesn't exist within the remit of research and within the the kind of publishing space and and what makes me more lucrative so I mean it, it, it is a fear to some degree for me, because I have seen in my own discipline that there have been individuals who are sort of ventured into um, the kind of, you know, marginalized spaces, uh, specifically with, with, with Dalit individuals. Um, and again, what, what, what purpose does it serve to, to have individuals from that community for, for that project specifically, or is it is, is there a fear of tokenism and, fe and, and fetishization again uh, of, of community groups within that space? So that's a very open question. I don't expect an actual answer from it, but it's a bit unfair. But I thought I'd throw it out to both uh, Sadhgirti Swati and to Jaydeep. 
Oh, it's a very interesting question, Anoop. And like, I am someone who have like literally seen this thing on the field when I was in the field work. And I was a bit surprised. And to, uh, when I started researching, I was a bit scared also, like because of all those ideas of cultural appropriation and whether I would be also might be termed under those umbrellas if I started working, going outside in the abroad, and then you are working over the Dalit culture, despite having all those privileged notions, whether I would be also come under that umbrella. And when I went for the field work and I realized like from at the top hierarchy in government to the people at the town, like within even the Dalit community, I, I sh couldn't and I would not point out some names. Uh, because of my research ethics and everything. But there were certain levels where even a Dalit performer who is working over this Bidesia style is being funded by the government. And instead of helping those rural Bidesia groups who are like literally have been working at the grassroots levels, who have been like on a cultural hierarchy or on a blood relatives also like of the Bhikari Thakur who started Bidesia style, has not been given money like they are the one who has been taking this tradition but somehow a, a scholar members from a Dalit community only is being funded by the government and he's cultural appropriating the same style which used to counter the idea of Hindutva suddenly has become the part of the idea of representing Hindutva in a much better way and it's none other than the people from the same community is doing that thing. So uh, as I mentioned, like in my research, I am looking out those purity and impurity binary, where you are going to put the purity, like the Bidesia being performed by the money of government, like they are portraying, even the government is portraying, like we are doing so much for the folk culture, but instead of doing anything for the practitioners and the performers, they are just altering that performers and performance that used to question those ideas only. And they are using the members of that community only to alter that thing. So uh, the tokenism and fetishization are clearly there. I was scared I might be called, but when I went into the details, I found like there are many layers of tokenism and fetishization from the government, from the members of that community only. And uh, then if you go into the diaspora, then there is another kind of tokenism like the same government who is spending on the diaspora culture and everything like making a close knitted community they are spending money on only those performing arts that they want to represent as an indian art the same folk culture is not being represented neither being funded which they might call it like okay we are doing affirmative action to include everything in it. Uh, inclusivity is our idea but it's all kind of fetishization. Even for the affirmative action, I will call like these are more kind of fetishization and tokenism rather than presenting as a resistance tool. So yeah, I, I've seen this thing. So it's something like I have literally experienced that thing on the ground level. I If, if I may come in or... I'll let the speakers go, the designated speakers go first. Yeah, what is important is nothing can be nothing can be seen as exotica. You know, it's not that you know someone can fall in the trap of exotica and work for some days and go out of it. But when we talk of tokenism, of course, you know, country like India. It's a challenge for the editors. Suppose you are compiling a book of uh, some best books of India. You know, you will also have in mind that I will capture different angles of India, where of course I will think of something coming from the ex northeast, something definitely from. Uh, the movement oriented, something definitely from women, space craving, something, of course, you know, from the Himalayas. As a country like India is very difficult to represent in a wholesome manner. We, the editors, often find we are in a fix. Whom 
to choose and whom not to choose. Very difficult. And we humbly write, my choice is not the definite choice. It can never be in, in, in India. Because if I define India by representing only one section, that is not the true India. And if I just like, if I talk about India by referring to Gandhi and referring to Tagore and referring to uh, Jahallal Nehru and without saying anything to annihilation of caste by uh, uh, Ambedkar, will it be a proper justice to look at India? So when we think of compile an anthology, of course, we'll have to think about some holistic matters that impossible in my our ideas are possible ways are taken care of you know very difficult to fall in a trap very easy to fall in a trap and very difficult to come out of the trap in a country in a, this is so varied a country and so unique only india can be compared with india only because therefore when you think of any pan indian project pan indian a uh, project of inclusivity, there is always this challenge. I say, make a challenge into an opportunity. And how you make a challenge into opportunity is the way you look into it. I know it's a Himala, it's a Himalayan task, and no other country, scholars of no other country can ever face it. But of course, it's our opportunity, and also it's our bonus because we are born in this country and we have we have the experience of so many varied things in our life which is which are not possible in some other countries and therefore means the legends the uh, epics india what not that the country can think of and therefore the writers as a writer Writers are very blessed because, you know, they have the gold mine or platinum mines of experiment, means, legends, epics, cultural mosaic in front of them to take and to fall back on. So my take in this is that I won't call it um, a tokenism or exotica, the idea of something very exotic. Because I'll say that the living is a total experience. And when we look at something, we need to be as inclusive as possible. I know there is nothing can be absolute, but the progress is, is always tends to be. So the process is, of course, very different, very challenging. This is only my take. Thank you. Over to you. Uh, yeah, Swati. Thank you. Um, to answer the question of tokenism and fetishization, I think we have to go back to also the colonial times because what has happened is uh, the artistic communities, the communities that in the pyramid fell under the title of shudras, those who were the uh, workers who worked with hands, they toiled the land, they made uh, pottery, they uh, made arts. That was their occupation. They were performers, they were creators. Uh, you have untouchable caste communities whose occupations also related to performing on funerals, uh, inauspicious occasions made them untouchables. Uh, you have colonial times when these arts were looked down upon, uh, be it women dancing, uh, women performers. So they get labeled as the slaves of God, Devadasis. You have someone from uh, Southern India called Nitya Pillai, uh, who is a Nat Bharat Natyam performer. And Bharat Natyam is a classical dance form of India, which has been, you know, very, very systematic, systematically uh, became a form performed by the upper caste women. Whereas in the caste hierarchy, uh, upper caste women who are, you know, carrier bearer of your caste purity are not allowed to 
uh, any mobility. These works were done by the performance in dance were done by the lower caste communities, untouchable communities. So how that art form gets a colonial erasure label of something not okay. And then over the period, it gets this classic dance label because the upper caste communities start to perform in the later periods uh, to go back to the culture this nationalistic assertion that happens uh, against the colonial imposition. So you have a lot of complexities that uh, go on. So in the colonial times, Dalit bodies, Dalit women's bodies, uh, lower caste women's bodies were fetishized. The art form is being fetishized. And in contemporary times where Dalits who are without rights, are now hyper-visibilized in literature produced by the upper caste for the Western gaze, for upper caste gaze and consumption. So you see that fetishizing happening very, very systematically. There is also counterculture. There is also a very interesting knowledge production that is taking space through uh, filmmaking, through uh, digital platforms, digital space, even though they remain in the marginal spaces, in the peripheries of the digital space, because it's also a reflection of our society, which is so unequal. So they are not in the mainstream, but they, the digital platform in some ways has helped in democratizing. So you see a lot of artists uh, performing on YouTubes, like Satkirti mentions. And so that way the pushback is happening. And there is many layers. Uh, if we look at tokenism that Satkirti was, was mentioning, the communities had to survive some ways. So for their survival, they might have accepted the erasure, they might have camouflaged, they might have systematically used certain ways, maybe coloniality, maybe the neoliberal market, maybe uh, even the caste, uh, I mean, class mobility. They used it to fight for their survival, to create space for themselves. If that is that flawed, maybe in some degrees it is flawed, but another context, it is survival. So uh, that judgment of the community which has been disenfranchised, which has been oppressed and marginalized, we can't, we'll have to look at it from a context. It's not that they are not, uh, the communities uh, can't be uh, put through critical lens. Of course, there has to be uh, critical engagement with patriarchal practices that uh, happen. But again, that needs to be looked through the cultural context that India is. If we look at Ambedkar's uh, text, uh, the very first text, uh, Castes in India, uh, their me gen gen its genesis and mechanisms, he talks about how certain Indian practices came into be and how these certain practices, be it the practice of uh, bride burning. So when a husband dies, a bride is, a woman goes behind his pyre, burns her, herself. This was one of the practices. The second practice was uh, that widow, forced widowhood. So a woman is completely removed from a, any social ex, uh, interactions when her husband dies or the third practice of child marriage. And he gives these three examples saying that at the core of caste purity, if you want to, as a society, perform this project of, we want as a group, an endogamous group, we want a caste purity, we will have to ensure that our woman's sexuality is controlled. How do you control the sexuality of a woman? By controlling her mobility, by making her, if there is in a, he talks about the surplus man, surplus woman uh, sense. And in a community, if you have equal numbers of uh, adults, men and women, if there is one uh, man dead, then you have a surplus woman. So how do you take care of that surplus woman? By sending her behind his pyre. How do you, if that is too uh, uh, audacious an act, then you will ask her to remove herself. She can live, but she can live like a vegetable. So remove her from any social engagements, put her 
uh, into force widowhood where she can not wear any color she'll have to uh, uh, shave her head and she'll have to stay somewhere in a segregated community that's force widowhood the third one when a man dies okay that's a, a laborer's issue labor problem um so if a woman is dead her man cannot go behind her and die why because it's a patriarchal society it's his labor is valued his social labor is valued so he gets a younger uh child as a spouse because he needs to have a spouse to carry forward the uh that social cohesion that they have imagined so that's how uh caste system more or less began that's his one example now how uh, we can debate about that theory but if you look at these ritualistic practices that existed in india it points to the fact that control of women's sexuality by any which which may so caste and patriarchy go hand in hand caste and material uh, disposition goes hand in hand or material privilege goes hand in hand so we'll have to look at these intersectionalities of caste class gender religion region language linguistic politics that goes around in the uh, country it's a vast country it's uh, yeah we can't really pin it down to what is happening say in the northern east uh, uh, part of the country where you have the most of the indigenous communities and what colonialism did to those communities to their erasure of their indigenous practices and knowledges um in the southern belt what did it do so all this we need to take into account if we are to talk about a community that is trying to despite this erasure that has happened for two centuries the anti caste movement has existed and tried to create this pan india sort of mo movement mobilization and even though there are different different terminologies and ideas that have uh define them be it dalit be it bahujan there are different terms that they use and these are all contested uh definitions like um, maharashtra communities will call themselves ambedkarite they've converted to buddhism so they take pride in that and there is contestations but that imagined identity of pan anti caste communities has been existing and has been there um thank you <laughs> that's that's my uh contribution here Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Swati. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to you. Please don't go away. Uh, but uh, 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 Jadeep uh, is, is is about to leave. Uh, it's midnight in India. Yeah, it's a thank you and a wonderful opportunity to share our views and lovely uh, Shati, you gave a very another uh, input, very pertinent input into it, and the forced migration that we that is. Uh, Sutkriti as defined in different parts of the world and what we think that you know, we all should work towards uh, the progressive movement of society. We don't know where we will reach out and when we will reach out with a definite goal. There's nothing called definite in this space but we are on in a process but definitely democratization of education and knowledge access of knowledge from anywhere any part of india uh, all knowledge is availability of knowledge availability of the knowledge system and uh, and the space for publishing your views or promoting your views uh, that that uh, are not restricted you know of course there will be resistance in society but definitely through contestation, the goodwill will prevail, isn't it? I know, very easy to say, but very difficult to uh, achieve it. But definitely we'll make some progress. And we made certain progress, but so much to go in the days to come through our mutual competence building. Building up mutual competence is very important in a country like India. I thank my co-panelists. I thank each and everyone present here. Thank you, Ambrose, for the opportunity you gave me. Thank you, and it's good night from India. We'll see you again. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Jadu.
It was quite an interesting discussion, Ambrose, and thanks for such a lovely panel. And it was quite good insight from Swati as well. Uh, I I think I just need to clear one point, like uh, Swati has mentioned about this thing. When I, I was mentioning about like how us, uh, during my research, I found like a uh, there are certain members in a community who are getting benefited. So basically, I was not mentioning like as a community is getting benefit, like if as a whole community is getting benefit, that's that's quite good thing. But it's a kind of a, I would say it's much more like divide and rule policy. And I am putting out a, even in my paper also, like how the same colonial mindset has been used by the majoritarian ideology at present also to divide these community. They are funding the same member of a community to make alteration in a performance, which is I am researching and taking away the performance which has been performed by these Dalit members of that caste hierarchy only. So it's like uh, diff creating a difference between two Dalits only by funding another members who is ready to alter that performance. So if they would have funded the whole project to that community, like when I went for interview to them and they were telling me like, we are the one who are at the grassroots level performing this and somebody else is getting Padm Bhushan, although it's a Dalit only who's getting Padm Bhushan, like one of the honorary awards, but they are the members who have been caring and they on the only thing is they are not ready to change their ideas of the performance. And that's why they are not being funded, although other per person who belongs from this community only is being funded. So it's something like, I'm not against the idea, like, okay, let's, if literally government want them to create an inclusive society and ready to fund, let's fund as a whole rather than using those kind of divide and rule policy, like, okay, who is altering those ideas of resistance, we will fund them, but who is not altering, we will not fund them. So this was just my argument. And it was lovely, like, great. Uh, I have also, like, as I mentioned, it's Malaysia, so it's almost three o'clock, Ambrose. So uh, I hope if you could, we could finish this. <laughs> yeah. So it's three o'clock in the morning. Yeah, yeah. in Malaysia. So yeah so yeah uh, uh you, you are right so on on, on this note i think I'll, I'll also say thank you to everyone who attended also thank you mainly thank you to uh our speakers jadip and satkiti uh and also thank you to swati karen and anup for for your uh contributions or interventions uh as you will notice or probably as you will agree uh, we haven't even started scratching the surface of this conversation. We haven't even started, you know, unpacking all the issues that are, this is just the beginning. So, uh, Civic Leicester has an open invitation. If you would like us to explore issues around this, please get in touch and we will host uh, a similar event, a similar panel, uh, maybe different uh, panelists, different art forms, but uh, the space is there, uh, the invitation is open. Uh, I look forward to uh, exploring things further. Um, the event today is part of Forced Migration in the Arts, which is a series that looks at uh, people with lived experience of forced migration, looks at uh, artists, looks at uh, academics, activists, and the work that they are doing in relation to forced migration in the arts. Uh, the next event will take place on the last Thursday of the month, next month. Uh, I'll send out invites. If you've got ideas on other topics we could explore, please let me know as well, and uh, we'll follow up on them. So on that note, thank you very much again to our speakers and also to people who attended uh, thank you and uh, have a good evening. Thank you guys. Bye, Ambrose. Take care.